Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. I think agility is about paying attention and being mindful, you know, paying really close attention to what's actually happening around us and being curious and having that sense of wonder about um, the world and the world of work. So who is Kevin Callahan? <laughs> oh, that's such a great well, maybe question. Maybe people don't want to know that. Uh, yeah, right. Who cares? Um, well, yeah, so so it is, I mean, I could give you a list of, of the things that I like to do, um, which is maybe sort of not particularly interesting. Um, what matters? I, I, uh, I have a few really deep loves in the world. You know, of course, uh, my family is one of them. I, uh, where I live, you know, we, we've chosen to live in a really rural area of Maine. Um, well, it's not a really rural area of Maine by comparison to most other places. It's very rural, but by Maine standards, it's actually fairly <laughs> suburban. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's like I was sitting out drinking a coffee this morning out on our deck and listening to the first of the songbirds arrive, um, which literally has happened like between yesterday and today. Yesterday, they weren't out there singing. And this morning, they're out there singing. So maybe they were out there yesterday. They just hadn't decided to start. So my time to move back to Maine is good. This is yeah, your timing is, is perfect. <laughs> it's like the best time, you know, winter's winter's behind us for the year. Um, so yeah, I, 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 uh, I really value a, a deep connection to the natural world and the, the cycles of the natural world. And, um, you know, being out, out where we live um, and working from home has allowed me to be, be hooked into that really beautifully for the last year, which is kind of one of those rare silver linings of this whole COVID thing. Um, I really love music uh, these days. That looks like uh, DJ, electronic dance music, DJing, getting back mm -hmm. into that um, after a long hiatus. Um, just really love the collage of taking other people's art and putting it together in different ways that kind of gives contrast and um, flow to that. That's it's, it's fun that connection um so you're doing and uh, yeah the glass well, uh, and uh, i think it was you and your daughter like putting something i saw um uh, what were you guys making uh was well we or? my daughter and i are in a band so we do yeah. we play together um so that's another whole angle in the music thing of, of actually playing live instrumental music um so uh so yeah that's that's pretty cool we do live facebook streams and this year and before that we were playing out and about in the local area and played um in pubs when we visited ireland a few years ago we we played around in ireland which was super fun um so yeah there's just you know there's a lot of i think multi-dimensionality about you know the, the interests that i have um you know from running chainsaws and intending forests and uh you know being active in my food system production and music and being outside and um you know, looking forward to getting back out in the mountains, backpacking and just sitting and looking at water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People are like, what do you do when you go backpacking? It's like as little as possible. <laughs> sit, sit and watch a pool for several hours is about the speed I like to, to go at and just take it all in. There's so much to see. Um, uh, and maybe that's a good segue into agility because I think agility is about paying attention and being mindful, you know, paying really mm -hmm. close attention to what's actually happening around us. And being curious and having that sense of wonder about um, the world and the world of work and, and the people we are with and uh, and how are we together and how do we show up together and and how do how do we be together um, mm -hmm. yeah well, so uh, i agree a little, a little bit in there <laughs> uh been there and you know a lot of it is about awareness and i think uh uh it's going back to the nature i think you know it's uh i spoke with uh, dave snowden uh yep. last week or the week before and he made that connection too about complexity management and you know for so long we've used the machines as, as metaphor mm -hmm. and we haven't really looked at living systems 
and say, how do we design organizations rather than like machines, but more like living systems? Yeah. Um, and that reminded me of that. Yeah, that's, and it's a profound metaphor, um, you know, because then there's lots of different living systems, right? There's, there's highly controlled, cultivated living systems like industrial agriculture, mm -hmm. um, which is starting to show some pretty serious drawbacks of sustainability in the long term. And then there's, you know, like the living systems around my house, which um, were, were managed by, you know, the, the native peoples that lived here were actively managed those forests for a very long time. Uh, and you could argue that some of the forests of Maine are wilder now um, than they have been for thousands of years because they're, they're just let alone. Um, and there isn't an active um, human element of, of management, you know, of working with the forest for a specific purpose, like a sustainable food production system. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, once, once we start scratching that metaphor a little bit and you start seeing the other kinds of intelligence, I think that are not human in nature, like mm -hmm. ecosystem intelligence and, and ecosystems abilities to self-regulate and achieve stasis for themselves which doesn't always go well for all of the inhabitants of those ecosystems. Um, some you often have to give up their lives to achieve that balance. Um, but I think it's, it does, you know, it starts giving us a, a bigger, more complete picture for complex adaptive response um, mm -hmm. than active, you know, predictive control based paradigms, you know, so. How do you define agility? You just mentioned agility. What's your, mm. I may have heard you say that before, but I'm just curious um, how, you know, we talk a lot about agility uh, from your perspective in context of business, maybe. How do you define it? Choice. You know, if you, if you, if you have, like, it's not a state, it's, um, it's not a thing, right? Like, oh, we're agile. It's like, well, do you have choice? <laughs> what, what, what choices choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah like what choices are available to you and and based on what and you know and, and invariably connected to choice is risk and commitment and um, reserves and all kinds of things um, preparedness um, and some of those things seem counterproductive you know like well if you're really prepared for everything do you really you know have you created so much baggage you know, like if I'm backpacking and I prepare for every single scenario, can I even, can I now carry my pack? Um, and does it defeat the whole purpose of what I'm trying to do outcome wise of going out there? And so, you know, it's a constant set of trade offs of what do I bring? You know, what scenarios do I prepare for? Which scenarios um, do I let go um, with the ultimate, you know, that I can bail out or, or just walk back to the car if <laughs> things get horrible? Um, <laughs> But uh, so from, from a business perspective, yeah, it's, I, I think agility is the, is the ability to choose and to constantly be um, refining that set of options, that, that set of choices, um, being very careful about what commitments are made, uh, mm. being very clear about what risks we're taking on, which, you know, from a complexity perspective um, is often really difficult to know because, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you don't know. You simply don't know what's really happening in a lot of levels. And some of those things that you don't know about um, could be black swans. Mm -hmm. You know, they could really turn your world upside down and then you're left in uh, pivoting like crazy. And I've been part of those organizations, you know, that, that were disrupted um, out of the blue. You know, they went from market dominance to struggling to survive in less than a year. And that could also apply to us, right? As a coaches, consultants, trainers, right? Independent, especially like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, having options and exactly what you just said about organizations. In a sense, we do have organizations, you know, legal entities, but uh, in your case, in my case, it's, you know, either small company or a company of one. And same, same principles, I guess, apply in that context as well. Oh. They, they definitely do, you know, like, you know, when I first got started as an independent several years ago now, about six years ago, um, you know, I, I, I took a gig. Mm -hmm. I had a gig, I had one contract, it was 40 hours a week. 
And those things tend to run on an annual basis. So then you lose your job every year. <laughs> and it's really stressful, you know, around October, November, sort of like, you know, what's going to happen in January. And it takes time to line up the next gig and, and the trade-offs of, you know, when my kids were young, I didn't want to be on planes every week. And so I was just constantly trying to stay close to home. Um, but the, the model at that time was um, one gig, which is no choice, right? And sure, it makes it easy to, like, you just show up and you do your work and, and it's steady for that year. And then it, when the year ends, it's incredibly disruptive. Um, and so I've switched over, you know, in the last few years, you know, I, I tried a couple of times, it took some time to get it going, of rather than having one big gig, um, you know, kind of have a, a large-ish gig. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then multiple smaller things, you know, doing some training, um, some, you know, smaller coaching engagements, you know, just, just trying to spread the risk out across an entire portfolio. Um, and again, that, that gives me choice, right. Yeah. And I, and, and it, it makes the risk a lot easier to, um, it, it, it breaks the risk from one big risk to lots of little risks. And that's yeah. always for me a, a much more desirable kind of context to be in. I think most organizations would like that as well um, mm -hmm. if they can negotiate their ways into it. So what about the organization? I know you this is gonna get you laughing. Well I hope it will, but <laughs> agility when it comes to government. Uh, I've worked a lot in the government space yeah. and you work decent amount. Um I'm concerned about where the generally government is. And uh, if I look, you know, next 10, 15 years, how much waste, how a government operates, and when it comes to that agility and options, uh, I am concerned as a, yeah. uh, a citizen, as a, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you recently worked uh with a state uh, on a multi-million dollar rfp yep um how was that experience and in general what ha what are you seeing when it comes to maybe just government specifically in adoption because usually it's just adoption of these agile practices within the government right um so i th you know i i think i mean my my take is I, I think it's symptomatic of large organizations that aren't equipped to become complex adaptive entities. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think it matters. Um, certainly in my, what I've observed in my experience as a coach working in large enterprise systems um, that are either private, privately held uh, organizations, uh, publicly traded for-profit organizations, or public organizations like government or uh, education, you know, higher education. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know those organizations are built to be stable um, and built to be predictable and built to operate in a world that doesn't exist anymore. Um, the ones that we we pay for as taxpayers, we just I think have a lot more scrutiny and higher expectations over. Um, though I think I, I see a lot of the same dynamics around governance and. You know, making big, uh, big commitments based on timelines that don't have any evidence behind them. Um, a, Do you a see lack any of... I mean, like I'm just like the more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there. so let me let me talk about the work that I'm. So I'm still I'm currently um, a coach at State of Maine. Yeah. I work uh, in the Department of Education and uh, and Office of Information Technology, and primarily, uh, you know, it was a classic agile coaching effort initially to work just with the software group. And then um, there was a murmur at DOE about, you know, some federal money that had come in around a longitudinal data uh, visualization system. So data warehouse with with uh, visualization on top of it. Uh, I got involved in that um, sort of to help them initially steer them in the right way. And uh, then with COVID, the, the money to pay for a coach went away. Uh, but then there was some money available uh, from this federal money around the data warehouse that we were able to tap into to to keep me there. So now I'm, uh, my role there is product development consultant. So I'm a delivery consultant, um, like a product owner, basically, for this data warehouse effort. And the first thing that we did was we wrote um, uh, a request for a proposal because we wanted to vendor it out. And... And I wanted uh, to write this 
this RFP in, in, a, in an adaptive kind of iterative quote unquote agile way. And that was totally novel there. Like no one had ever, I mean, they had heard of it up there. They didn't really know um, what that meant or how to do it. I was, so I referred them to the U S air force. Uh, I can't remember the, the guy's name, the chief software officer at the U S air force did a, he guested on uh, Gene Gendel's less uh, podcast okay. a couple of years ago about um, how the U.S. Air Force has, um, you know, become a total DevOps operation, and how as part of that they have figured out how they do agile procurement um, to work with vendors in a in a you know really agile way. And so I had read a bunch of that stuff and referred, um, you know, this, my stakeholders at State of Maine. I'm like, look, the the federal government has figured out how to do this. So we don't have to figure out how to do it. We just have to figure out how to do what they've done in our context. And people were actually really excited about it because, um, you know, state of Maine, there's a lot of really smart people up there who are really dissatisfied with that big batch, um, you know, pay for everything up front, make all your commitments up front, and then kind of cross your fingers that in a couple of years, you'll have some piece of software that is going to meet your needs. And very often, and I'm assuming it, the contractors would be receptive to that too, because like when you're on, the, you know, I've worked on both sides. Yes. Um, and as a contractor, you're like, let's just win this contract, and then we're gonna figure out what we do yep. afterwards. <laughs> uh, yeah, me, me as well. Like, and so one of the the guiding principles for myself was I want to write the contract, or I want to write the RFP that I would like to have responded to. Yeah. Right. With all, and so so what we did with it was we kind of took a a product development approach. And, you know, I, I made the statement that, you know, we should always have working software that creates value for us as soon as possible. Like, let's find something, let's find a pain point that we can solve really, really fast for the department and then build on it over time. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure that we put the stuff that isn't required for some of those high pain points but it's incredibly risky at the very end so that if it all blows up it's just the tail that's blowing up and we still have kind of a core of working software that's creating value for the people of maine um, goes back to those options right yeah exactly yeah. and so what we did with the rfp is we broke it into some phases um around like both chronologically what do we need uh, functionality wise and kind of comparing that with which parts of this work are known mm -hmm. versus which parts of this work are unknown and the parts of work that are known are really low risk like for instance it's we know what the the database schema is because it's an open standard we know we want it in the cloud that's like there's tons of cloud providers that know how to do that we know all of the security that it needs and all the authentication levels that it needs and all the all of the the governance that needs to be true to have that be a compliant um, piece of art in infrastructure mm -hmm. that's all known right like there's you don't need to like i don't think iterate on that or be like you know um, how much is this going to cost or how long is this going to take the vendors that we want to respond to this thing will have done this before you know and so while they might not know exactly they should be able to say it'll be somewhere in this ballpark mm -hmm. right um, so that's, so that's one kind of work, uh, the visualization libraries are all, I mean, there's entire product sets that are just what we call cots. They're configurable off the shelf products um, that you just sit on top of a data set, right? So you have on, on one end of this thing, it's kind of like a barbell, right? And on one end of the barbell, you have this known infrastructure piece of, of data that's totally denormalized. And then on the other end of this barbell, you have this known visualization piece that's going to take the data sets that you extract out of that and make um, kind of make it easier to consume them. Uh, it's the middle part that's going to be really, really hard. Really tough, yeah. Because that piece has to be a visual report builder that is quote unquote intuitive and easy to use. And I have no idea what's intuitive and easy to use. What's intuitive and easy to use for me is totally different for someone else and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, we've got a, a divergent set of personas on this thing. Um, you know, we have people who who understand, for example, uh, the domain of education data really, really well. 
And then we have people who have like, like, I don't understand it very well. I, I just have kind of, I'm curious about my local school. Like, and so can somebody like me um, versus somebody like a data analyst at the department both get what we need out of this tool? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And so that's really risky, right? That's really um, much more challenging. And so what we did with the RFP is to, to break that kind of risk into its own phase and say, we don't know how much this is going to cost, but we still have a, a limited amount of time and a limited amount of money. So what we're asking the vendors to say, tell us is, um, in your experience as you know, building interfaces, um, how often is your sense, like how many iterations do we need and how much does mm -hmm. each iteration cost? And, so and so we're just, just buying to kind of backtrack. It's almost like yeah. you're using Canadian or just understanding level of complexity. And then you're saying, okay, if this is low complexity, it's pretty straightforward. We use one type of approach and uh, yes. you know, uh, one way. Um, so you're, you're kind of using the sense making, some type of sense making mm -hmm. to determine and uh, divvy up the work rather than one size fits all. It's fixed bid, fixed scope. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, one of the things that Dave Snowden is really clear on is, is, um, things are not homogenous, mm -hmm. right? Like there's no such, like you can say, sure, this thing's complex and it's probably not entirely complex, complex yeah. or this thing is, is complicated or ordered, but it's probably not entirely or all of the same type. Like there's liminality mm -hmm. and there's fluidity and there's pockets. It's, it's more fractal geometry than like clean boxes. And so, so it's what easier to put things into clean boxes though. I you know. know and, for our heads. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and yeah, and then when you try to deliver it, it doesn't turn out that way because that's not the way the world is, right? And then you end up oh, so it's so frustrating. So um, so yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like let's take this thing apart, let's break it apart on these seams of risk and complexity, and then have mm -hmm. strategies and approaches that are fit for those different kinds of risks. Mm -hmm. And so on lots of different levels, you know, from the the overall kind of like what I said earlier, of like let's defer the 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 risks that aren't on the critical path, put them at the end. Mm -hmm. right because if they're, they're nice to have really i mean sure we need a bare minimum of them for for um procedural reasons mm -hmm. uh but from a business perspective and a, and, a, and a money perspective uh we don't need them oh another interesting thing was um you know the the, the federal money that came in was supposed to be matched by state funds well with covid those state funds like ain't there <laughs> right like they're just not they're, they're 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 vapor right and so this this idea was created um pre-covid the federal grant was awarded pre-covid and so now there's commitments that have been made and then covid happens and some of those fundamental assumptions have totally shifted you don't and what have do the you money do that you said you're gonna have <laughs> yeah like what do you do and so you know even within that like we've still been able to adapt and have choice because of this approach that we've taken to say like well you know yeah we need to be able to say that uh, we've met these criteria of the the federal grant that came in um we just won't be able to do them to the same degree as we could have if we had more money mm -hmm. which is no longer on the table maybe it will be in a few years um as the the main state economy recovers we don't know but regardless of what, whether or not that happens, we'll still have a, a, a core of a working system that creates value. And that's really, really important. You know, I think that's You're really not wasting important. wasting projects. Like, well, it's, it's crazy how many times I tell, and I was uh, recently working with California DMV, and it's like uh, there are projects in the, in, in, in the works for two years. The code has yeah. never been seen, seen any, mm -hmm. you know, it's millions of dollars. Uh, yeah, invested and nothing delivered, and yeah. uh, it's like oh, it's so easy to scrap it and let's let's move on to the next thing. You know, we get the budget right. next year. Well, yeah, you know, and, and it's I, I I recently consulted on a or coached on another. It was last it was a couple of years ago now. Um, this massive effort um, that I can't really talk about the specifics of. Yeah. Um, it's not it, it hasn't turned out well. I'll put it that way. And they brought me in about six months into the implementation phase of their multi-year project plan. And again, they had, they had made a bunch of commitments based on, you know, spreadsheets and work breakdown structures. And, you know, it established the schedule based on dollars. Like nothing was based on the actual work. 
it was just based on you know guesses and and so they brought me in um you know and they're like halfway through their calendar and halfway through their work and and feeling pretty good i'm like well is the second half of the work the same as the first half and they go oh no it's much harder and i go but you're halfway through your time and money but you you're not halfway up the mountain but you you're telling me you need to reach the summit and they're like yep and i'm like well what can you cut uh, you know scope wise and they're like nothing it's 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 100 percent or zero and i'm like so you're telling me that you get 95 percent done is actually zero percent done because you still can't go live with it and they're like yeah and i'm like and that's, yeah. i'm just I'm just seeing like, you know, red flags everywhere. I'm just like, I don't know what to tell you. Like you, you hired me to, I think to help. And so the way I'm going to help is to, to tell you that I think you have some fatally critical flaws in the commitments you've made. And I think that this thing is already like, if it were me, I would already be pulling the fire alarms on this project. Um, Cause I don't think you're going to make it. Yeah, I mean, but like you, you were a developer, right? The first <laughs> before you yeah. go into this stuff. <laughs> yeah, for uh, a long time. If you go back, right, twenty years, this is how large organizations operated too. And I feel like you yeah. know the government is there. It's not like it's new. It's just that the you know large organizations that were there 10, 15, 20 years ago, they have evolved past that. And governments, government, especially yeah. large government agencies, seem to be um, stuck there. And maybe just uh, to uh, broaden it, you know, a um, little bit, uh, not just contracts, but like finance. Um, yeah. The, the, you know, the budgeting cost centers uh, versus bu budgeting, you know, mm -hmm. some type of service product lines. Um, what is your experience in government or maybe outside of like how much does the finance need to because usually HR and finance oh they are... yeah, it needs to change drastically yeah. so maybe let's <laughs> so, stick to finance and then talk about HR um, yeah what are your thoughts on finance well and, and I would just make one other comment about what you just said around you know large organizations have evolved well the ones that are still here have and a lot <laughs> a lot just couldn't make it a lot have failed and we know that the lifetime of a, a company's, like if you look at for, for profit publicly held organizations who are you know traded on stock markets, um, that the the life expectancy or the, the term expectancy of a company that makes the the Fortune 500, I can't remember exactly how much shorter it has gotten over the last sixty or seventy years, uh, but a lot. You know, like it, it used to be that if you could make it to that level of performance as an organization you're you're up there for a while um and that's just not true anymore you know the the rate of change is too high and i think and our, the covid and the the crisis that we're going through will probably expedite that too because it's any it's of them still, do yeah, yeah any of them do um any of them do and and you know that it's it's very interesting like there are some organizations you know if we just look at here in maine um there are some organizations that actually have done quite well um you know like uh the grocery industry has done pretty darn well uh, the veterinary industry has done pretty well um the outdoor equipment industry has done extremely well um you know go try to find a mountain bike right now uh good luck right the bike local bike shops have done very well which is has before covid i mean that was like a a, a shoestring of profit margin uh, but with well, COVID, everyone luck though. Like, I guess you always have to have luck too. But uh, grocery stores never saw themselves as technology companies. And I usually talk about like how Amazon started thinking right. and Amazon Go. So at least uh, I was joking, but somebody was telling me here actually in Maine, you know, a year ago, you would uh, order your stuff online at the store, you would go to a grocery store. Mm -hmm. Somebody would come out, take your credit card, run inside, <laughs> run, <laughs> it. <laughs> run uh -huh. it, and then somebody would come out and uh, you know uh, give you stuff. half of the grocery. Well, not, you know, half of stuff. Oh, not even, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's not very, you know, that's not options. It's just, but you know, I joke around, but like it's a, you know, yeah. insurance companies, grocery. When everybody sucks in your industry, <laughs> you, right? You can. Uh, well, 
you can make up for it, uh, you know, but uh, if Amazon was more ahead and like if they had, uh, there's no way that any of the like even Food Lion or the Lays or mm-hmm. these bigger, you know, largest company, uh, grocery or supermarket companies in the world, um, they, they won't be competing because they don't have the options. They, 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 they you know, consider themselves in one industry and haven't really evolved to uh, to really treat themselves as the technology companies. Um, so I don't know. I, I think it's a yeah. little bit of luck, a little bit of. Uh, uh, <laughs> They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're getting there. Uh, they're getting there. Um, yeah, you know, and, and another thing um, I do want it to hit on, um, you know, what, getting back to the, this idea of, of state of, of government and, and, its, and its rate to adapt and shift and change and, and sort of evolve. Um, you know, before we jump over there, you know, one of the, the things, uh, again, I think Dave Snowden is one of the, the clearer thinkers we have in our, in our world these days and in our space. So I, I'm a, a huge fan. Um, I refer to his work extensively you know I'm, I'm a member of the the cognitive edge um whatever they call their premium network so i get yeah. access to a bunch of stuff and you know i'm sort of or authorized not sort of authorized to to teach the kinevin framework which i is always a just you know when i whenever i get pulled in to an organization that's step one is like mm-hmm. you know we gotta talk we gotta be talking the same language around complexity and at least having a working understanding of the fundamental dynamics of it um, and so one of the things he 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 spoke about it, it was more a couple of years ago. He's talking about apex predators, um, you know, that ecosystems evolve to support a certain kind of, you know, basically an apex predator. And when the ecosystem changes, um, the things that gave that predator the advantages to be the top apex predator suddenly become liabilities, and they tend to um, struggle, if not just go extinct. Uh, so the the big Example of that, of course, is the dinosaurs. Um, you know the the adaptations they had for a world that world v- literally evaporated, just vaporized with the, this impact. Um, mm-hmm. And the things that were able to uh, thrive then were these little furry, warm-blooded mm-hmm. mammals that, prior to that moment, um, were basically just like food for everything else. You know, and so um, when the environment shifts. And it does shift, you know, like it's not always catastrophic like that. COVID was kind of like that. Um, the internet was kind of like that, but it took a little longer for it to really kind of roll in and disrupt everything. Um, you know, but COVID was like that. It it disrupted, it fundamentally disrupted the ecosystem, the economic global ecosystem. And mm-hmm. some organizations that had evolved to be really effective uh, so suddenly we're irrelevant, mm-hmm. you know, think anything in the travel industry, <laughs> you know, that entire industry just evaporated. Um, there's certainly, there's, there's ways that it's coming back, but, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I think there was a lot of pain in it. I spoke to him, I asked him about the question. He posed it uh, a while ago, but essentially the correlation between um, uh, efficiency and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, efficiency, effectiveness with agility, and you know, essentially, what his response and based on what he researched said that you know, the the more efficient you are, and the more that you try to specialize in one, the mm-hmm. less uh, adapt, the less options you have because you're trying right. to, uh, you know, uh, and a lot of companies are trying to do that without taking more diverse. I think if you look at Amazon is a good example yeah. of trying to go, you know, deep, but also broad. Um, yeah. That was, uh, that was something that kind of resonated with me when it comes to agility. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, and uh, he was talking about, it. he was referring. To... <laughs> it's funny when I talk today, he always picks on, you know, who he's going to call out. And he was yeah. calling out yeah. Nassim. Uh huh. Yeah, those two kind of go at each other a little bit. Uh huh. Uh, But he he was you know he's like you know he used he didn't he couldn't come up with uh, any other words so he he was joking and poking fun at uh, Nassim about using you know the term anti fragile. So yep. uh, But but he used in the context of you know uh, organizations and uh, 
what is that correlation between being effective and efficient and being able right. to respond to change? Well, yeah, so and, maybe, and, yeah. So what well, yeah, so, and done so, and, so that, um, again, it, it, I like these kinds of more open-ended conversations because they invariably end up finding <laughs> threads anyway. Um, yeah. You know, which is kind of a complex adaptive thing, right? You you let things emerge. Um, you trust uh, that that you know the the right thing will happen. Um, so we started this talking. You know, you asking me kind of who is Kevin Callahan. You know, rather than like from a a LinkedIn bio perspective or sort of a professional persona, like who are you really? And what's important to you about um, your identity? And when uh, when organizations optimize for any one dimension, which usually these days is efficiency and, and profitability, mm -hmm. and that becomes the only force that acts on them, and that's the only force that they cultivate and and uh, and kind of reinforce. Um, measure against <laughs> yeah measure yeah, whatever you know whatever they hire for it they 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 fund it they all of it right um mm -hmm. they fire by it which we had talked about before the recording <laughs> um you know they balance their books according to it when that is the only kind of operational force on that entity you incur risk over time that often will take um a very long amount of time to come to bear and then it comes to bear in the combination, an unpredictable combination of small things that on their own are relatively harmless, but when they come together, create catastrophic failures of that system. And uh, there's a, a guy named Sidney Decker who does research. He says, I, I, study system, I study what happens when things go wrong. And so he's done a lot of research into the aviation and aerospace industries about you know, major catastrophic failures Mm -hmm. And um, that body of work is, uh, I've seen it referred to as called resilience engineering. And so one of the takeaways from that is you must, uh, you must actively bring multiple forces, balancing forces to bear often in direct tension with each other. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you want a true safety culture, um, so the, you know, a perfect example is up at the state, you know, I'm working uh, right now with a group where we're mob programming. You know, I'm trying to introduce some more modern and have been really effective in introducing and people are starting to see the value of, of, of like behavior driven development and mob programming and test driven development. And one of the things that um, I've been just really a, a hard ass on is like, you can only do this for so long before you start having diminishing returns. And, and you, you, it's time to stop when you start making errors, when you're tired and it doesn't matter um, if you still have an hour left in your quote unquote work day that, you know, uh, from a capacity utilization perspective, we would, we would count. And it's not like, oh, you just screw off for the rest of the day. No, you, you find something else to do that's valuable, but you stop doing that thing because you're starting to make errors. You're starting to write bugs um, and just continuing to pretend that you can go because there's still time on the clock is false. And so a belief in quality is going to, in some cases, come up against your belief in efficiency or a belief in the dignity of human beings is going to come up against your belief in efficiency. And that's good. That's what we want. We want those to be countering forces. And it seems like, oh, but that's making us less efficient. It might be, but it's making you more effective and it's making you more resilient and it's preserving your optionality because you don't know what's going to happen. Or the belief in the flow. Being a developer, you probably <laughs> can relate to that. There's difference when you're in the flow and you know when uh, yep. uh, when, when you're not are going versus when you're not. So yeah, uh, and being being aware of that and it goes back to uh, you started with that. You know, and, and when you introduce yourself, it's that yeah. awareness, right? It, it, if yeah, you're aware of what's going on, then it's easy to step and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna step away from this right. and go to something else. But if you don't have that, yeah. Idea, and so to bring it back to the organizational perspective, it's like, well, how does that matter to organizational life? Um, I, you know, we definitely need to be measuring things. Absolutely. Cause you know, we have constraints and those constraints are, uh, you know, 
even in in government it's there's still a finite amount of money and a finite amount of time um and the you know the currency that i've I've taken to speaking in terms of with my work in state government around helping people to articulate the why of doing, of prioritizing one piece of work to another piece of work is, um, well, what are, are there financial implications like with funding? And often there are. And if there aren't, um, well, how much time are we going to save, you know, like a superintendent or someone out in the district or, um, you know, how, how are we going to improve the lives of, of students or parents or whatever if we do this thing? Like, are we putting roadblocks? Like, you know, I don't know. Does state government or government in general have a reputation for being easy to interface with as a citizen? No, it's awful, right? It's yeah. terrible. Like, finding stuff is just atrociously difficult. Um, and how, to, you know, because our time is precious. Our time is valuable. And so if we start talking about time as a currency, then... Um, that helps drive prioritization. I compare government uh, to spectrum and uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, provider people that don't understand. Yeah. The provider and people yeah. that, that might be outside of the United States. It's uh, interim provider. You don't have any options, at least in the areas that I've lived. Yeah. Like they're the only, so it's same like government, you know, it's like if they had any competition, they would be out of business. If somebody was just doing it a little bit better than them, but uh because they don't it's uh it, it's a good spot to be in and uh uh it, yeah like... <laughs> yeah you know and, and i and i guess you know with if, if we if we pull a thread of this rfp like one of the things that was that was really f incredibly surprising to me is i i as we wrote this rfp and we were kind of um in a little pod of of uh you know like data managers and and whatnot in doe and, and we're kind of writing this thing and i was terrified that when we brought it to like procurement that they were just going to be like that's not how we do things around here go do it as a traditional rfp like go redo it and we were really it was a beautiful surprise when we started showing this to other people like lawyers and accountants and procurement people um that they were like people were really excited and they were you know they were like this is a better way you know we've been looking for a better way like i think it's important to remember as Brene brown says like look these are just people here and um you know one of the things that has you know i've been w working off and on in state government for a few years and that, that sure there's there's your kind of stereotypical bureaucrat there so that's not everybody you know again it's not homogenous there are a huge amount of people who are incredibly passionate very purpose driven far more so than in the public sector um, that are mission driven that are that are invested in the long term that are invested in what they're doing um, as public servants to make you know government work on the behalf of the citizens uh, better and i think that's a, that's a really important thing um I think it's just a really important thing. I think it's really what cool to see. What about if we see. go back to Drucker and the system will be the person, you know, so yeah, you know, Brenna, you know, uh, um, and, and there's, you know, the, and the system has also been built to not change. Right. So you have these incredibly passionate mission driven people in a system that is literally, I mean, it, it requires an, a, a literal act of legislature to change it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so people like, and, and I saw this in the large organizations that, that you know, you and I met and worked in as well. Of uh, the, the people that, that end up staying in those places for long periods of time have a resilience and a survivability that I respect very much. It's like people figure out how to get stuff done regardless or in spite of the organizational structure, not because of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially when we start talking about agility and responsiveness, like there's people, you know, frontline people um, are always finding novel ways to get around stuff and get stuff done, you know, exactly. and, and, and make their customers was, happy. It's just incredible. It is. And uh, back in 2011, um, I worked with the state of Idaho Health and Welfare. And this is where Obama um, Care and State Based Exchange came about. And uh, it was a deputy uh, at the uh, state of Idaho and welfare, essentially, that 
really understood. He took a lot of agile classes, trying to understand this agile way of working. Essentially, he created a structure, an agile structure on top of the traditional um, mm -hmm. government bureaucratic. And it was amazing, like what, you know, we, uh, uh, it was over a couple of years and it was, uh, you know, you would have anywhere from five to 13 teams over that period. But it was just like, what, you know, amazing things can happen if you have senior support and understanding. Oh, yeah. Even though in a bureaucratic and uh, where well, you technically can't change the jobs, but he was acting as a product owner, as a deputy. Yeah. So that was a big thing where he's involved and like understanding what needs to change. How do we get dedicated teams? And if you have leaders with authority that can change the system, even just layer on top of existing system, it makes yeah. a huge difference. Um, then, you know, having system that influences, uh, influences or dictates a lot of things yeah. that you need to do. Yeah. It's, it's a great, point you know you know some of the work uh, i'm doing right now with with that doe oit group you know which when i showed up was very much like an us and them mentality and has now shifted you know i've been there for a while now um and people are really you know the narrative has changed they they talk about we and you know they reach out to each other directly and they have conversations and they include each other and and there's um is it perfect? Of course, it's not perfect, right? There's still um, there's still hard things and conflict and um, places for improvement. Though there's there's been some really powerful um, coming together and collaboration, which has been allowed and enabled and supported by the senior leadership of those of those groups. And I'm under no illusion. I've I've you know the first place I worked as an agilist, you know, we spent uh, five years um, transitioning into a, a truly agile uh, organization, you know, especially the technology group. Um, they hired a, a new VP of, uh, of uh, you know, a software engineering, new engineering VP about four years into that. And he walked into the place and was like, I feel like somebody just handed me keys to a Ferrari. Like, you guys are amazing. How fast you can, you can pivot, how well you understand things. You know, the, your back, like just our, our agile practices were, were humming. Um, and you know, and he was just blown away. And then sh shortly another year later, so, um, we had some executive changeover and the, the new leadership was not as supportive of what we were doing. And it, what took us five years to build took about three months to just reduce to rubble. Really? Um, it just, you and I it, have seen that. Um, yeah yeah you know, and it's uh, when we over and the, over yeah. again like and and that's a pretty common story like one of the people i work with um you know she's like yeah it's, it took us a decade to build uh you know in a school district organization like a, a truly high functioning organization that with leadership change was just it just fell apart within a matter of months um so this stuff is you know it's 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 really elusive. <laughs> it's it's really in its own way. It's resilient, but it's also you know from an ecosystem perspective. Um, if you don't understand how to feed it, care and feed for it, and keep it alive, like it'll die on you. Well, it'll die. It's also like you know, like the uh, disengagement numbers huh? in the United States in general in the workforce they're high, right? And yeah. it's like it's so easy for people to disengage when you spend a year, two years buying into something, leadership changes, and it's a completely different direction. And it's like yeah, uh, it's demotivating um as an employee to buy into something to support it and then to have somebody come in and just completely shift. And then these leaders are asked to change it right you're not coming in if i hire you kevin as a ceo or cio whatever you're not going to say oh i'm going to do exactly right. the same thing as the other person to build on it no i mean you're going <laughs> to say oh i have a completely different way uh well this, yeah uh, i mean i i would it, it would be nice if that weren't true you know if there was a little more humility around like let's find out what's actually working about this place before we start um, changing it though again i think there's a lot of pressure to not do that and and just you know just tenure you know one one way to uh, another thing that i've just seen time and time again is is that people understand the the fragility or the dependency on 
on those senior leaders. And if they're not incentivized to stick around, um, it's just constantly churning, you know? And so again, like one of the things state government does really, really well is it has, it's very stable, right? And so when you do have the right people in these senior roles, they tend to be there for a long time and they, and they really care and they really want to build things that, that last and that work. Mm-hmm. And that's very different from most, um, certainly the, the companies that I've worked in that are for profit, you know, the, the senior level managers are constantly jockeying to try to get to the next level and like get the next thing. And, and so if they stay in a role for one or two years, like that's, you know, even in manufacturing, I, I did some uh, consulting work when I was in grad school. Um, at a manufacturing facility and they rotate their general managers of their plants every two years. Mm-hmm. And some of those general managers are really good. Like the guy that was there when I was working there was incredibly well respected and loved by the factory floor. You know, the, the, the workers on the floor, they really, he, he would walk out on the floor. He would go talk to him. He knew who they were. Um, he knew it was important to them. He knew uh, he respected the work they did. Um, mm-hmm. And, and they were all terrified of, or not maybe terrified is too strong. They were concerned what happens when he rotates out and we get a new guy. Um, Because the new guy, like to your point, like they don't, in in the American system at least, um, I have not seen, uh, except with the, with the exception of one, um, the, the VP of engineering that I referenced who who showed up and said, I feel like somebody handed me the keys to the Ferrari. um, He spent, you know, the first month or two just sitting and listening and Those asking questions <laughs> yeah and just trying to figure out like what's the game here like what's the what's the landscape in this company um uh, before starting to make changes to it but most people i think show up um quite the opposite and they're like i'm going to put my mark on it and here's how i roll and and oftentimes they bring their own people with them and clean house and install a bunch like of like at least in the director level in uh in government they're appointed roles so new governor comes uh, in, and at, they have yep. a point. Right? Well, at the commissioner and deputy commissioner in Maine are appointed. And then once okay. you get below that, at, at the director level, um, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're government employees. Employees. That are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, commissioners are, and, and deputies, are, they're, they're, they're employees as well. But, you know, again, they're, they're uh, appointed. So they change with, um, and then there are cer- certain um, chief executive roles that also um i mean they're still hired they're not a, they're not appointed you have to go through a hiring process with them mm-hmm. um but and then they can um you know i'm thinking of like the the cio the state of maine i people that have been in that role have gone across um uh you know what do you call a when the governor changes um just losing the word at the oh. yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so see, I know exactly what you're talking about. But, uh, <laughs> administrations, right? Administration. They can they can persist across administration, whereas commissioners and deputy commissioners um, change out, which is another whole. You know, then then you when you get churn at that level, you get you get a lot of those same challenges. Where you know, how do you get a, a coherent strategy? Um, you know, when you have a vow, you know, when you go from a Republican to a Democratic governor and vice versa, like it's not just a, a small change. It's it's like a paradigm change of values Mm -hmm. and and so um you know so departments are are trying to navigate that and and again like that that churn uh you know if you think of that as sort of like oscillation or whatever at some in some ways gets smoothed out by the bureaucratic structure beneath it Mm -hmm. and the people that are actually in there like they're they're just trying to get stuff done for the people of maine that's why they that's why they're there you know and and so in some ways um, they're able to respond really effectively. And in some ways they're totally hamstrung. Um, so it's, 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 you know, again, it's, it's always a more complex thing. There's always more things at play uh, than, than, than it seems on the surface, you know, and it's yeah. easy to just, you know, I've had these conversations with a lot of people who are like, ah, government, this and government, that it's like, you haven't been inside of a large corporation. Have you? <laughs> Because large corporations operate in a lot of the same ways and are just mm-hmm. as screwed up. It's just you don't have the transparency into it um, exactly. that, that, you know, in the same expectation. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's all very interesting stuff. Scale is hard. 
operating at scale so is really hard. Scale, maybe the, is the last question here. Um, scale and uh, what I've seen over the years and uh, uh, even dating back to that uh, 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 engagement with uh, uh, state of uh, Idaho health and welfare, mm -hmm. that was a safe kind of mm -hmm. brand initiative. Uh, I see more and more uh, scaled agile framework uh, yeah. in government. Uh, the safe has now safe for government. What are your thoughts on safe and safe in government? Maybe have you had experience with that? And uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, as a last question here, maybe. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so my so I my my personal opinion of, of it is. Um, that the safe is is a an accretion or an accumulation of, of a, a lot of really amazing patterns that on their own um are are powerful and amazing and when you put them together you get this just monster um uh, that's incredibly unwieldy um i think it takes a a very very senior level agilist to be able to understand what's happening with safe and what's happening with all the different pieces and how they work um you know like i i'm over a decade into this work and and there's parts of safe that i'm like i don't know that i understand that um and so we're taking something that that's that difficult to understand and then just throwing it around like it's a prescriptive solution and it's and it's not so um and i you know i i i'm i if you look at like the department of defense at the federal level um they released a draft a white paper a couple of couple of years ago called detecting agile bs oh, um, which was su <laughs> supposed to give yeah. guidance to procurement you know government procurement people who were working with vendors who are claiming to be agile and it's like well here's some guidelines around um some questions you can ask around what's what's truly agility uh and which is just you know kind of like process change um and mm -hmm. so it had some stuff in there that um that safe violates like you know do your teams actually talk directly to your customers like yeah show me a safe implementation where the the teams are <laughs> have any access to customers um and then the u.s air force uh they actually have named c the commercially successful scaling frameworks as problems and that you know you should avoid them you should actively avoid them um i think you know so i every once in a while i get to talk to um like this senior decision makers who are deciding kind of what are we going to do and, and inevitably safe comes up and mm -hmm. and i go well you know when you scale you just get more of what you have um and so is if if you're trying to get a better business outcome but you don't know how to do that but you're you're going to scaling to do that for you um i would suggest that you're you're not thinking about it correctly and you're just going to scale your risk um, not your benefit Sometimes it's about descaling not scaling yeah yeah then that's what less is about right like descale yeah. first and then and so um so i i all i always coach to say like you know and, and and back in the early days of safe i think like back in 2012 i i went on a webinar with that laughing while himself was giving um and he was really clear you know some of those early proponents of safe were really clear like safe is built on the effectiveness of uh, of high quality technical practice and you know really high performing collaborative teams delivery teams mm -hmm. and if you don't have those um, that's the foundation that you scale off of and so if you don't have those i think the first step is like go figure that stuff out like go figure out how to build um products that aren't full of technical debt and that um, are high quality not only in how they're built but they're high quality and that they actually achieve the business outcomes you intend them to achieve um, you know, so they're either making you money or saving people time or whatever that that thing is, uh, and that you you have high performing teams that you've invested in uh, doesn't mean you don't they don't change their makeup. You know, it doesn't mean people don't move around. And Heidi's Heidi Helfen's stuff around dynamic reteaming is really powerful mm -hmm. with that. Um, but regardless, you you know you need to have a, a really high performing delivery capability uh, that you protect and foster and cultivate um, and 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 then you can start talking about you know how do we how do we like amplify this out throughout the organization mm -hmm. um so i i take a very uh, evolutionary approach to scaling 
you know, which is figure it out. You're going to have to figure it out in your context. You know, and again, we know that from complexity. When you take things that work in one com one complex context and just map them into another, um, it's probably not going to go the same way. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So don't try to do that. Um, take the long view. You know, like, like take an organic view. Grow an evolutionary process um, that you measure and and can verify and have feedback loops into at every step toward exactly. strategic outcomes that matter to your business. And most places and think, don't even know the yeah. strategic outcomes that matter to their business are. So it's like, well, then. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think this is what, you know, I, I, I've spoken to six, seven uh, people that I consider uh, thought leaders in, in, in our industry. And they said the exact same thing, right? Yep. Which aligns with my thinking too, uh, that there is no, you know, I pledge allegiance to no framework. Or no, you know, there's, uh, like you said, there are good patterns and there are, yeah. you know, better patterns, there are anti-patterns, um, but it's really, uh, you know, uh, adjusting things to the context and the situation. And like you said, then start it off with uh, ha creating those options uh, that yeah. are in some way uh, positively contributing to your business. So. Um, yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, what the, the thing that I would sort of wind down with is that um, agility, I believe, really comes back down to just sound business fundamentals. Mm -hmm. You know, they look a little bit different, but it's still like, you know, do you have a strategy? Do you understand your purpose? Um, do you have uh, systems and governance that allow you to action that purpose? You know, do you have the people... You need you probably do because people are pretty resilient pretty adaptive um so are you giving them are are they able to perform as the, your business needs them to and if they're not um how are you investing to to shift that and you know when you do all those things um the culture is sort of a trailing indicator of organizational effectiveness comes along you know and, and you see people starting to say different things about um how they make sense and make meaning out of out of what's happening um, and when people start changing their behavior at that level you know you've gotten a cultural shift you've achieved Same a cultural exactly, shift but that's yeah. you can't start with that uh, because culture is never something that you can directly change it's an outcome exactly. it's a result 